Look at the next parable. He put before them another parable. Verse 24, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in the field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the seeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came to him and said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do what you want to uh, then what sorry, an enemy uh, the slave said to him, Then do what you want us to go. Then do I, I've got a misprint in my Bible. What does it say? Then do you want, that's the way it should be. I've got a misprint. Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you should you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, do we have a narrative? Okay, so we've got a narrative metaphor of the kingdom of heaven uh, drawn from common life. So what's the nature of this common life? It's another agricultural View, but we got a bigger operation at mind in here. Um, master has slaves doing the work. They've sown the field. Um, what is odd in the story? It's one stupid enemy. If you want to destroy someone's crop, how do you do it? What's the best way? Torch it when it grows. There's, yeah, there's all kinds of ways. But planting weeds in it, that's more like a high school senior prank. <laughs> Hard work. <laughs> and it is. It's, you know, so you're out there. But that's not, I mean, so it keeps getting. So, you gardeners, if weeds pop up, do you leave them until the end? Why do you pull weeds? Okay, so that's right. So in the earlier parable, we just talked about things choking out the plants. But here, no, let's leave them and we'll separate them in the end. Now, again, we're not looking at realism here. It's a story and we've got eschatological judgment being portrayed. The sheep and the goats. Here we have the wheat and the tares, right? So tell me what, what is this about? There is last judgment here. But it, it, remember, the parable is of the kingdom of heaven. And I think it's all, where's the already? I, I heard mumblings. There's, there, seed is sown. But there's also weeds. That's where we are, right? So that's, we've experienced God's salvation, but darn if there aren't weeds in this world. Um, what is the traditional interpretation of this parable? Since John Calvin on, preachers have been saying, no, they don't talk. Come on, when you've heard this preached, in your church, have people, has your preacher really talked about the end of time? What do they talk about? What do they ask you? Are you wheat? Are you a weed? So, the way it's often been used is in the church, there are the elect and there are the not so elect. And it is not ours to separate out. God will do that in God's own time. Leave the wheat and the tares together. Um, that's the way it's often been translated, um, uh, interpreted. Um, but let's look at the interpretation that Jesus offers, starting down in verse 36. It skips after a little bit. He talks parables, and then he comes back to the disciples. Verse 36. He left the crowds, went into the house. Remember, Jesus has his own house. And his disciples approached him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. I guess that means they think they got the others, but this one they're confused about. 
He answered, so we get an allegorical interpretation. The one who sows the good seed is son of man. All right, keep your, your symbols in your head. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels and they will collect out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers and they will throw them into the furnace. They are the ones gone and the faithful are left behind. Um, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone who has ears listen. Okay, what, what are our symbols again? Let's see if you can remember without looking. It's, it's pop quiz time. All right, who sows the seed, the good seed? All right, so far you got an A. Let's see if you can hold it. What is the good seed? Children of the kingdom. And the bad seed? No, not the evil one. Oh, Children of the evil one, Shh. redeemed yourself. Who is the one who sows that seed? There's the devil, okay. Um, who are the ones who will reap the angels? Okay, so we've got all the characters from the verse. What about the slaves? What do the slaves in the first story symbolize in the allegorical interpretation? Don't look, you're cheating. I said no looking. <laughs> the slaves aren't mentioned. Jesus, just forget about them? No, the, the, I'm asking, Jesus goes through and assigns each element of the story a symbolic import. But why are the slaves left out? So remind me, what, what do the slaves do in the story originally? They pose the question, what do we do? And what does the master say? So, not your concern. Don't do anything about them. I think the slaves are left there so that the church, the readers, us, the disciples, put ourselves into the story. We are to reside in that in-between time. We're not to go take care of the weeds. We are not the ones who do the harvest. We are the ones who try to live faithfully in the in-between time. We're stuck in between. That is gift and burden. It, I think in this parable, I want to be careful that I wouldn't make a blanket statement about all parables. But the fact that he's talking to disciples, as opposed to the crowd here, implies, and remember, because Matthew is very consistent if we looked all through, Matthew presents the disciples as representatives of the church. So the fact that Matthew is talking to the disciples here, giving them the private interpretation, and the slaves who pose that question, what are we to do, in a sense, that's us. We are not responsible. Now that goes against the social gospel hymn we heard in one way. The social gospel movement said, and Priscilla said this perfectly, they thought their job was to bring about the kingdom of God. Matthew says, no, it is not. It is not your job because you are unqualified to do that. You can't bring about the kingdom of God. The only person you can bring about is who the, owns the kingdom, and that's God. Now, that doesn't mean you're to do nothing. right? It doesn't call for apathy. We live in, we live in response to those headlights coming over the hill. We adjust our car. We turn our beam down. We live now. We try and have an existence leaning toward 
that reign of God. But we should never have the hubris to imagine we can bring it about. So we don't divide the wheat and the tares in the world. We simply live with them and serve in the midst. Go back to verse 31. Especially, I think that is part of it. But um, in the already not yet, in that in-between time, it is not our place. That's exactly right. Um, now, there are plenty of places where Matthew calls for judgment, right? So, so it's not that we make no judgments. Um, but remember, the last parable of the eschatological discourse was about the Gentiles being righteous. It'd be very easy to say those who are not with us are against us. And Jesus goes, no, it's not quite that simple. In the eschaton, there are people who look to be of otherness, who are doing the same kind of righteous work we want to be doing. So, I I think you're right. Uh, The parable of the mustard seed. What is the parable of the mustard seed about? Well, you've heard this forever. What have people said the mustard seed's about? Faith, faith, that's so sweet. It's so wrong, but it's sweet. (laughs) Now, there are... This same metaphor is used in other places where it is absolutely about faith. If you have the faith of a mustard seed... The problem is we take that and read it into this parable, and it's not the case. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's not faith like a mustard seed. It's the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. So the eschatological experience, existence, is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when it's grown, it's the greatest of shrubs, becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Okay. Narrative? Not much of a plot, but there's movement. Trees, you know, seed planted grows. So we have another agricultural common life. See, What's the twist or the oddity in here? Well, this isn't about faith, and there um, aren't mountains in this story. So what? Tree. Uh, Gardener guy here. Ever planted mustard plants? (laughs) What's wrong with Texas? It is leafy. It's a leafy crop everywhere. Actually, it's what mustard is. Have you seen mustard plants? Ever eaten mustard? What's a mustard plant look like? There is no such thing in the world as a mustard tree. But this says tree. Well, that's a relatively It is not. It is a technical Greek word for tree. They had the word for bush. He chooses tree. And we call them weeds. We don't call them trees. You're trying to do a historical scientific explanation when that's a... There's a twist here. Everybody in the ancient world would have said... The moment Jesus said that, they go, there's no such thing as a mustard tree. And then they go, he's just dumb. Oh, maybe he's not. What's that about? Right? So I go back and I tell my daughter that fairy tale I was saying, and then I suddenly have her being a tall, strong black man. She's going to go, ooh, there's a twist there. That's not who I'm growing up to be. What is that about? And that becomes engaging. So the very fact that Jesus says tree is a, a symbol that there's the oddity, the twist that should grab us and go, what in the world? Because... In, in, in relative life, normal life, I plant a mustard seed, which, by the way, is not the smallest of all seeds, but it's a pretty tiny seed. I plant a mustard seed, and it grows into a nice-sized bush, maybe five feet high if I'm lucky, right? So it grows into a nice bush, not strong enough to house the birds of the heavens. It's leafy, it's a, no branches. So when Jesus says, but the kingdom... 
is like a seed, mustard seed becoming a mustard tree. We go, oh, this isn't like anything we've ever seen before. It may be drawn from common life, but there is nothing common about the reign of God. It is extraordinary. It only comes about by divine intervention. We live in between the planting of the seed and the not yet of the tree. That is Christian existence. We live in the world of mustard bushes. But someday we will live in the world of mustard trees. I mean, the metaphor plays that way, that we are the people in between. Right? Well, I, I do think that scene is hyperbole to talk about what wondrous land this is going to be. And so I do think this works similar to that. I mean, that, that scene's not eschatological, right, in, in the same way. But it, it is. It's intentional exaggeration to have an effect. So... If I say, um, um, that concert was so good, everybody from Houston was there. Well, you know, I'm just talking, there was, gosh, the amount of people there was amazing. But I used exaggeration to have a better effect. That's sort of what this play is. But it's to go as far as to say, we can't imagine yet. We can't imagine what yet is going to be. We live toward it because we trust in God. We've already experienced enough of God to know that it only is going to be better. But in the meantime, there's poverty, there's violence, there are weeds. Mustard bushes aren't horrible, but they're not mustard trees. So there is a, a, a goal-oriented, future-oriented, hope-oriented part of Christianity that I think we have to be careful not to have lost. I don't read the Bible literally in the way a fundamentalist would, but a fundamentalist will recognize that there are parts of the Bible that are not literal. Right? A fundamentalist doesn't look for history in the parables. The parables they know are fictional tales, and they know there are literary devices uh, through. Now, they might argue with me about the grapes, where I said that was exaggerated. They may go, no, if it says that, it's historical, right? Absolutely, they would say that that's historical, and I would say it's not. It's metaphorical, mythological, symbolic, and has a different kind of import. But, but I want to be careful to say that I, I just don't want to over-characterize evangelicals and fundamentalists as not having any nuance of reading. I, I think we've got to be careful about that. They, they might not agree with what I say about parables, for instance, completely, but they would certainly recognize the eschatological character of them, they might read that differently. Um, they would recognize they are fictional stories Jesus used to speak truth of a different sort, that kind of thing. Um, but take, for instance, say the story of Jesus stilling the storm. Jesus is in the boat, they wake him up, saw the storm, they still it. Now I would read that story as a symbolic story. I would talk about things that that you know, means about the power of Jesus that reflects on ways we experience God, etc. Now, uh, evangelical fundamentalists who would claim the Bible is inerrant would say that story literally happened in a way I wouldn't argue. But if they preached it, they might still well use it metaphorically. That doesn't mean they're stuck to only being able to say this is, the way, this is the way it happens and that's all there is to say about it. They have a both and, whereas I have an either or. So I, I, I just want to be really careful about it. It's easy for us to sometimes attack fundamentalists and evangelicals as not being as nuanced as us. And they do come with a different um, interpretive lens. And, and I disagree with it strongly at times, but I don't want to stereotype them in a way that doesn't do fairness to them. Okay, look at the next parable, because the metaphor is the whole narrative. I think when the Bible wants us to read it allegorically, it offers us allegorical interpretations or it makes it more clear. Um, so I don't think this is it's about that. I, the, because it says in the beginning what it's about. The kingdom of heaven is what this is about. Now, people will interpret kingdom of heaven differently than I. I mean, I grant that. But 
it's not about church or numbers or something. I have a little bit, but not a lot. And it's mainly because it's behind Matthew 24 that we were referring to and all. But I would also, so we can talk about it just a little bit, same way with Revelation. I wouldn't look for that, those allegories in terms of contemporary things. I would, and I do think those are allegorical descriptions, but look in terms of Antiochus and the king of the day and things like that and what it means. Um, one of my professors, Abraham Malherbe, who was a Church of Christ uh, professor, a brilliant man, when he was teaching my class, that, uh, my intro to New Testament class, and talked about the book of Revelation. He said, now there are people who go through scene by scene looking for symbols of what they pointed to in the ancient world or what they pointed to in the contemporary world and what they point to in the contemporary world. And he said, that's fine in some sense, but in my opinion, it really misses the point. And this is a Church of Christ guy talking, remember? He says, really, it's one image after another in which at the end, God comes out on top. And the point is, keep on keeping on. It's keep the faith in light of the not yet experience. And so for a Church of Christ guy... To say that it really had an impact on me. Um, so I, I think to get, I, I do think a lot of those stories have historical references behind them in terms of symbols. Um, I don't think that necessarily means we have to look for them now. Do you remember, the, I mean, the whole 666 thing? One of the big drawing points was Ronald Wilson Reagan, six letters in each of his names, clearly the Antichrist. I mean, we can. Every generation looks for those things. And then when it doesn't happen that way, you move on. I think to look for those kinds of literal chronological things is to miss the point of these. Does that help? Or, I mean, maybe you can disagree, but I mean, at least you understand what I'm saying. Okay. All right, let's look at the next one because it's parallel to it especially. Uh, these two parables, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast, are almost identical in structure. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed it with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Um, this doesn't seem like much of a parable. What do you make of it? Common life? Okay, so here's your problem. It's fun to be in this position. Uh, what you did was just identify the kingdom of heaven with the seed or with the yeast. Remember, the whole story is the kingdom. It's not one part of it is the kingdom and then you think of the rest of the story. It, it's hard for us to do this because we want to look for the connection, the symbol. But the whole story, not just the leaven, but the leaven in the flour in, um, uh, that becomes leaven, the yeast in the flour that becomes leaven, the whole thing is the kingdom of heaven. So, what, so all right, common life, narrative, sort of. Yeah, okay, there's movement. Oddity, what's strange? Now, mine didn't say 60 pounds. You're cheating and reading the NIV. That's right, though. So here's the odd thing in it. I think the NRSV says three measures. And that's literally right, but it's not, it doesn't help us in modern world. Ancient person would know that is 60 pounds of flour. <laughs> How much flour does this woman need? <laughs> Sorry, need. Um, a woman's job in the ancient world often was to make a loaf of bread every day. So, you know, the whole practice, for instance, of sourdough bread where you keep a little out and you keep it going. You needed a loaf of bread every day. Remember, this is a humid world. We didn't have preservatives. You didn't have plastic bags to put stuff in. You didn't make a bunch of bread and last the week. It was, it was daily uh, hard work and all. 60 pounds of flour would make an extraordinarily huge amount of leavened dough, and then it rises again with bread. You could feed all of Jerusalem with this. So you get the sense there's the extraordinary part of it. It's, it's not meant to be a, a story that makes literal sense. 
it's meant to make eschatological sense. Little bitty bit of leaven, 60 pounds of flour. Someday we're going to have a lot of bread. And we can sit under that mustard tree and eat it in its shade. Right? It, it is extraordinary. It is divine and supernatural in the way that it's presenting it. So um, I, we've got this already not yet. That's what the first part of the discourse primarily sets up. It just names that as fully as it can for these hearers. So we shouldn't be disappointed. Now put yourself in the mind of an early Christian in Matthew's community. Jesus hasn't returned. Part of what Matthew is saying is trying to interpret that. Already not yet. You, we already have the beginning of the eschaton. Jesus coming began. We, there's been a turning of the age. We live in the end of time already. That's still true today. We still live in the end of time. This is trying to set up that the delay of the parousia is not a problem. It's just a fact. It is the way it is. We'll see the next few parables now sort of take a, a little twist to it. But I think it's a good time for a break.